Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for joining us in Central Study Hour. We're so glad that you're joining us wherever you are or however you're tuning in. Let us sing our first hymn request comes from Dylan Hemmings of Jamaica. Dylan requested hymn number 449, Never Part Again. Let's sing all three verses. Jesus reign and never never part again thank you so much Dylan for your hymn request that you sent us if you have hymn requests please visit our website at sacscentral.org 
click contact us then scroll down to CSH song request tell us your name where you from your email address and the title of the hymn we'll be happy to sing your hymn request on the upcoming Sabbath Let's sing our second hymn request comes from Trudy Brahams of New York. Trudy requested hymn number 50, Abide With Me. Let's sing verse 1, 3, and 4. Please join us. Father, thank you so much for your blessings, Lord. We're here to worship and praise you. We need your Holy Spirit and your presence as we're ready to listen to your words. Bless our pastor, Pastor Fred Dana, who will teach us your Sabbath school lesson. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Central Study Hour will be presented by our associate pastor here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor Fred Dana. I hope you have a good study. I want to welcome everyone to Central Study Hour. However you've decided to join us, live stream, or you're sitting here in our congregation, um, all right, if you catch us later on YouTube, however you join us, we're glad you have done so, and we appreciate you being here. We're studying Lesson 10. It's called Doing the Unthinkable. It's in the quarterly on Isaiah. And if you're interested in receiving a CD or DVD of this lesson, call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org Ask for offer C22110, C22110. And make sure you specify if you want a CD or a DVD and make sure you leave us an address. And before we go right to the lesson, I just wanna say you know, that in Central Study Hour, especially with our live stream audience, um, you hear us, but we don't hear you. And we would like to um, maybe have a better connection with you. 
And so we would appreciate it if you are blessed by Central Study Hour, if you appreciate Central Study Hour, Central Study Hour has helped you, and especially if you'd like it to continue, uh, please write us and just tell us how you feel. Uh, tell us what you appreciate, and we'll read your letter or your note as part of Central Study Hour. So do that for us, okay? Uh, I think that would be fun. So then we can have a connection going both ways. All right, so let's go to the lesson, Lesson 10. Lesson 10 has a very interesting title, Doing the Unthinkable. Now, when I think of the word unthinkable, I think of people expressing their shock or aghast at some, somebody having committed some unthinkable evil, some terrible atrocity, like the Holocaust was unthinkable, child abuse is unthinkable, mass murder is unthinkable. But today's lesson is about something unthinkable because it's so incredibly good. Well, and disastrous in a way. So let's go to the memory verse and that'll kind of clue you in for sure. Uh, memory verse says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So incredibly good, but also incredibly horrible. Kind of an irony there. Well, the uh, author of the lesson introduces this, this week's lesson with a story that I would guess probably took place about 200 years ago, maybe more, um, about a Chinese Christian. I don't know if I'm going to say his name right. It looks like Lu uh, Fook. And um, he was concerned about his fellow Chinese that had come to South America that had been uh, forced into slavery in the South American mines. He wanted to share the gospel with his fellow Chinese. But how could he have access to them down in those mines? His solution was to sell himself as a slave for a five-year term so that he could go down in the mines. And he did. And he went down in the mines. He told his fellow workers about Jesus. And his five, before his five years were up, he passed away. But over 200 people were liberated from hopelessness by accepting Jesus as their savior. And we were like, I don't know about you, but I'm in awe because I don't think I would want to do that in a million years. Sell myself as a slave. Uh, such amazing self-sacrifice just for the good of others. Think about this. By doing the unthinkable, that is, humbly taking the form of a slave, Jesus, too, had reached the unreachable. That's you and me. And all the world steeped and lost in the abyss of sin. I couldn't have come up with a better introduction to this lesson. This week, we're going to look at this incredible event prophesied hundreds of years before it happened in the book of Isaiah. So let's go to Sunday's lesson. And, you know, you can open your book to Isaiah, your Bible. Isaiah, and we're going to review a little bit before we go into today's lesson. You, so you can open your Bible to Isaiah 42, and I'm going to look at the, the author's words here at the beginning of the lesson, Sunday's page. It says, if Isaiah intended to convey only information, he would lay out all the details regarding the Messiah all at once. But that's not what Isaiah did. He didn't have one chapter that says, here's everything you need to know about the Messiah. He didn't do it that way. It says here, but in order to teach, persuade, and give his audience an encounter with the servant of the Lord, he develops a rich fabric of re recurring themes in symphonic fashion. And so last week, we did part one of this, uh, you know, from Isaiah 42 to Isaiah 53, the main recurring theme through these verses is the Lord's servant that would come. Uh, and so last week was part one. We went from 41 to 49. Today we're doing 50, and that's the end of 52 and 53, which comes to the climax on what this servant would do. So this is like part two. So let's review a little, just a little, this my servant theme, recurring theme, 
And let's go to Isaiah 42. And we went into quite a bit of detail on this passage, but we'll just look at it, just to refresh your memory a little. Isaiah 42, verse 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. Remember the Lord said, the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment, or justice, to the Gentiles. And then verse 6 says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. What person could be a covenant for the people other than the Son of God himself? And then verse 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring the prisoner, out the prisoners from the prison. That, this is the passage that started the My Servant narratives. So let's go to um, uh, chapter 49. And look at a little bit there. Uh, chapter 49, Isaiah 49, and we'll look first at verse 3. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant. So there it is again, my servant, O Israel, in whom, in whom I will be glorified. And then we'll go to 5, the first part of 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. So he came from the womb. And six, uh, the second half of 6. I, also, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou may, mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And that's obviously Jesus. And then verse 7, the first part. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nations abhorreth, to a servant or a slave of rulers. Stop there for a minute. Everything said about the servant is, is really good until you get to this verse. And then you find out that that servant is going to be despised by humanity. It's going to be hated. And, but then the last part of verse 7 shows a totally different ending. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. And then you look at verse 8, uh, past the middle points. I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. Again, he will be for a covenant. So that's kind of the key verses that we, we've, that we covered last week, and we spent more time on them. And now we're going into chapter 50, where there's more prophecy about the coming servant. And so chapter 50, let's go to verse 4. We're going to hit some highlights from verse 4 to verse 10. Uh, verse 4 says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Now, right there, it isn't clear it's the servant, but verse 10 ends it with calling him his, God calling him his servant. So this passage is about the servant. So the servant would be given the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a, a word in season to him that is weary. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. This servant would know how to speak a word to someone who is weary and laden, bowed down. Does that make you think of any words that Jesus said? Remember he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus was fulfilling this very passage. Then you go to verse 5, it says, The Lord hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. At what time in Jesus' life did he say, Do I need to go forward with this? Can I get out of it? Remember the guarding of Gethsemane, he says, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but, you know, your will be done. And so it says that he did not, he was not rebellious, neither turned away back. This is Gethsemane. Verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, when Jesus gave his back to the smiters, he was scourged with the, the Roman whip. And those Roman whips had embedded glass and sharp stones woven into the material. It shredded you badly. And he gave his back to the smiters. His cheeks, you know, they pulled hair out of his beard. They spit in his face. You know, for anyone who's a Christian, you can't look at this verse and not think of these things, right? You just can't miss it. Then verse 7 says, For the Lord God will help me, 
Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. You know, there's an interesting passage, and in, it's in Luke uh, 9, 51, where Jesus told us, he had just told the disciples he was going to go to Jerusalem and, and die and raise up in three days, and, and so they don't want to go to Jerusalem. But Luke 9, 51 says Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Set his face comes right out of this passage. This passage says, set his face like a flint. Nothing could turn him back from going forth to fulfill his mission, even that great suffering to himself. And then verse 10, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? See, that's who we're talking about here, the servant. That walketh in darkness and hath no light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. It's a pretty powerful passage, and you know, this is just leading up to Isaiah 53. But it sounds a lot like Isaiah 53 already, doesn't it? On, in the quarterly, there's a large paragraph toward the bottom, before the box, um, three or four lines down. I'm going to pick up where it says, in Isaiah 50. He's going to review a little because he wants to make a point. In Isaiah 50, people strike the servant, painfully pluck out hairs from his beard, and spit at him. What makes these actions an international, intercosmic incident is that the victim is the envoy of the divine king of kings. This isn't just anybody that's getting beat up and bullied and pounded down. In fact, by comparing Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, and Isaiah 11, 1 through 16, you know, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 is the one that talks about the the, mighty, the child that we born, wonderful counselor, uh, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And Isaiah 11 is, you know, a, a shoot or a branch from the root of Jesse. It uh, says, uh, by comparing those passages with other servant passages, we found that the servant is the king, the mighty deliverer. But with all this power and honor, for some unthinkable reason, he does not save himself. This is so strange that people didn't believe it. At Jesus' cross, leaders mocked him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one, let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and shall be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not." Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall, men, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You know what's interesting about this passage, besides all the detail? This is the most referenced Old Testament passage in the New Testament. This was the favorite passage of all the New Testament writers, the disciples, the Apostle Paul. And it's not hard to imagine why, is it? Well, the, on Monday's page, it's entitled The Suffering Servant Poem. Uh, the author has, you know, has says that this whole passage is known as the Suffering Servant Poem. It confirms Isaiah's reputation as the gospel prophet. You can understand when everyone says, where's the gospel in the Old Testament? Well, this would be the best case, right? Uh, so the author says, in harmony with the excellence of the gospel, the poem towers above other literature. Though breathtakingly short, every phrase is packed with profound meaning that reveals the core of God's unthinkable quest to save a race steeped in lost and sin. So the author says, you know, this is not the milk of uh, Isaiah's uh, word or Isaiah's message that he's actually prepared his audience by developing this messianic theme through earlier parts of the book. And so he says he started with uh, the conception of his birth. And um, if you want to try to keep up with me, just go to Isaiah 7, um, verse 14. This is the passage. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and, and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then he introduced the Messiah as the coming Davidic king. If you go to chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7 brings out the Davidic king part. But let's look at that. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So he's the Davidic king there. Then you go to chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Does that sound like Jesus? The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding? Yeah. Who, who could do any better at any of those than Jesus? Then you go to verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. You know, and then we already looked at the, the beginning of the My Servant passage, passages in, in Isaiah 42 that describes his ministry as tender um, to bring justice to the Gentiles. Um, and verse uh, chapter 49, we saw the same thing, except that's where we got introduced to the, that he would be despised. And so the My Servant passages, all this stuff has been building up to this suffering servant poem we're in right now. It's all been building up to this throughout Isaiah's book. Can you see how those earlier passages prepared the reader for the unthinkable sacrifice of the coming Messiah? All right, let's consider 
some points of this passage in this suffering servant poem. Let's look at the um, Isaiah 52 again, right where it begins. You know, because when I read through the whole thing, I didn't stop to comment. And, um, but look at uh, verse 13. Isaiah 52, verse 13 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled, extolled and be very high. He'll be very high and lifted up. And, you know, what the author is bringing out here um, is that this preview of what's coming gives a stunning contrast because in verse 13, he's high, he's lifted up, he's, he's exalted. And then in verse 14, they're astonished because they see his visage is marred more than any man and more than the sons of men. That's pretty, pretty powerful. How does somebody so highly exalted be so marred you can't even tell who he is? We'll come to that uh, again in a minute. But then that's why the question's there in Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? How can anybody believe that somebody so great, somebody so powerful, the Lord of the universe, could have a visage, a countenance so marred, he's unrecognizable? Who can believe such a thing? That's the question. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right. Now, let's just look back at 15. I skipped 15 for a minute. Uh, he says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, there's a, there's a Crawford reference to Isaiah 36, 25, where it talks about sprinkling being a cleansing from sin. There's a, some atonement uh, concept here. He shall sprinkle many nations. He shall cleanse the nations if they will turn to him. And kings shall shut, out their, shut their mouths at him, for that which hath not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard shall they consider. In other words, even kings of nations would be in awe of what the servant had done. And it would give an opportunity for those nations to collectively, as a nation, receive the truth. And that happened, you know, of course, uh, over time in the history of the world. Um, we could even say, even though our nation doesn't have a king, we would count unto this, right? Uh, you think of the, some of the European nations that, where the gospel went in their early years. All right, so now let's go to verse, chapter 53, verse 2. It says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of, dry, out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now this is really interesting. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't have Hollywood looks. He won't be Joe Hollywood. Um, he won't have um, nice, impressive clothing. Um, no accessories. Um, no power, no wealth. There would be nothing of a worldly nature that would draw people to him. He would make no grand entrance at all, because the drawing to him would have to be purely on spiritual grounds, with no confusion with anything else. All right, and then you come to verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. This verse makes clear that he would be rejected. You know, in, in the Gospel of John, it says he made the world and he came into the world and the world knew him not. And then it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. That's verse 11. Rejected. All right. Um, verses 4 through 6 are a unit. By the way, this um, poem actually has five sections. And the first... Um, Three verses, the, the three verses from the end of um, uh, Isaiah 52 and the first verse of Isaiah 53 are probably the first section. And then I just finished the second section, which is just two verses, verse two and three. But verses four through six um, are going to explain why he suffered. All right, because we see he's suffering in verse three, he's rejected, but why? So, uh, what we find in these verses that is that his suffering is really our punishment. It's what we were supposed to get. And he bears, he bears it all 
to bring us healing. So let's look at that. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. You see in every one of these three verses, it's all about we, our, us in connected with what he did. So surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And what did, the, what did humanity see instead? Instead of seeing a sin bearer for them, what did they see? The last part of verse 4 says, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. When Jesus was on the cross, the collective human reaction was, He deserved it, the imposter. No, hardly any recognition whatsoever that he was bearing the sin for, for us as humans. Now we have had the opportunity to be able to look back on this story and be taught but that was the natural human reaction at the time. All right, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So his sufferings... Uh, were our punishment, and he took it for us. And see, up until this point, it wasn't that clear. Now, if they thought about the sacrificial lamb with any understanding, they would have had a chance to know that all along, but that tended to get lost. And so Isaiah is making it so painfully clear that it was your sin, my sin, that put him there. All right, um, and then verses 7 through 9 is the fourth stanza. The fourth stanza is the stanza of how he comes to his death. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. In other words, he's this silent lamb. Um, he's silent in his trials. How many verses do you think there are in the Gospels that refer to accusations and the clamor and the trials, and it says he answered not a word. There's a few of them. He answered not a word. So Jesus clearly fulfills this verse. Uh, second part of verse 8 says, For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. You know, being cut off out of the land of the living, you know what that makes me think of? You know the 70 weeks passage in Daniel 9, when it says after 69 weeks, he would be cut off, yet not for himself. You know, so Daniel uses the, the Isaiah's expression. That cut off expression came from Isaiah, and Daniel used it later. Verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. You know, and, you know, this is interesting because here's a prophecy that his grave would be with the rich. And then if you go to Matthew 27, you have four verses explaining carefully, so you can't miss it, that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate, begged the body of Jesus, and took him and put him in his own tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. You, you couldn't get things more precise, really, could you? All right, so he, 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 it says, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. What's another word for deceit that's a Bible word? Huh? All right, a lie, but I'm looking for a particular unique Bible word that's not often used by us today. Huh? It begins with G. Guile. There was no guile in his mouth. And that the, the guile and deceit mean the same thing. And this is an interesting passage because we're going to look later, if I don't run out of time, Peter uses the word guile instead of deceit when he quotes this passage. And then we find the hundred for a thousand that follow the lamb wherever he goes are also like him and they have no guile in their mouth. In other words, they don't color the truth. They don't distort the truth or they don't outright lie. They don't even tell white lies or slanted lies or any kind of lies. No guile, no deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Now that's kind of puzzling. Do you think when it says it pleased the Lord, it means God was happy with his suffering? I don't think so. I think it means it pleased the Lord because it was God's will for our salvation. It pleased the Lord because we could be saved. And it pleased the Lord that, his, that the Son loved that much that he was willing to do that. And that's why we see he's exalted. All right? And then the next part of verse 10 says, When thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed. 
In other words, he'll see his children, children in the faith. He shall prolong his days. What does prolonging his days imply? After he dies, he will rise again, right? Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Um, by his knowledge shall, many, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. In other words, salvation will now be possible for everyone in the human race that will choose it. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. What does this sound like? It sounds like the first verse of the poem, right? It says, my servant shall be exalted and extolled and very high. It says, he shall divide a portion with the great and shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was counted as a sinner or even as a criminal like the thieves on either side of him. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the intercessors. Now, I want you to think for a minute about this. You remember when Jesus went to the temple and he's 12 years old? When Jesus went to the temple and he saw the Passover service, Desire of Ages says this is when it first came clear to him who exactly he was and what his mission was. And while he was pondering these things, he's pondering all these scriptures he knew. Don't you think this passage would have been very prominent in his mind as he's thinking about it? Well, then he gets left behind. He finds the, the teachers in the, the classroom, and they have an idea that the coming Messiah will be this conqueror and drive out the Romans because they take passages about the Messiah being exalted and emphasize those. And so when Jesus was asking them questions as a humble 12-year-old, he took the position of a learner. He asked them questions about Isaiah 53. He, he wanted specific explanations for things. And they were blown away. They couldn't help but see they had the wrong view of the coming Messiah. You read that chapter on Jesus in the temple and Desire of Ages. And it says there that if they had taken seriously his questions, it would have resulted in a revival in Israel. And he's only 12 years old, just figuring out who he is. And he could have started a whole revival then if they would have listened. And she says they were convicted they had a wrong view of the Messiah by a 12-year-old who presented himself as a learner with tact and diplomacy. He didn't go in there telling them, you guys got it all wrong, man. That wasn't his approach. That's kind of what you know, our tendency is. That's why we don't win people very easily. We're too blunt. You know, we're too quick to tell people they're wrong instead of just give them a chance to see something. You know? All right, let's go to Tuesdays. Who has believed? The author makes some really good points here. Isaiah 52, 13 says, God's servant is highly exalted. So he's going back to how it starts. But without warning, the next verse describes his appearance as so disfigured he cannot be recognized as one of the sons of men. And then he re references the scourging, the crown of thorns, the crucifixion, and above all, bearing the sins of the human race. Sin was never intended to be natural for humans. Bearing it made the son of man appear inhuman. Then he says, compare this with the story of Job. You know, Job was a rich man of great honor, right? And suddenly he's at the bottom. He's lost everything. He's sitting on ashes, scraping painful sores with a piece of pottery. And the contrast is so great that his friends didn't even realize it was him when they first came. They said, Job, that's you? So the question is, why does Job suffer? Why must God's Messiah suffer? Neither deserve it. Both are innocent. Why, then, the suffering? And really, the author is just repeating the same question Isaiah asked. Who could believe this report? It doesn't make sense. How could you believe it? So Job's suffering had to do with Satan's accusations, as we know, and Job passed the test. But the Messiah's sufferings were necessary for the atonement of the human race. He took what we deserve. He took our penalty. But... He did more than take a penalty. There was a revelation in the cross. A revelation of how terrible sin is. You see, in order to have a safe universe someday, 
There has to be an education so people understand how terrible sin is so they'll never choose it again. And one of our best ways of getting that lesson is to see what it did to God himself. And in the book Education, Ellen White says that the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the suffering that the Godhead has had inflicted on them since sin began. In other words, every day for the Godhead is like the cross. Every day. Because they have, a, they have infinite love and they see all this suffering. Can you imagine every day being like going to the cross? That's how it is for the Father and for the Son and for the Holy Spirit. But we got to see it once so we can grasp it. But now we need to realize it doesn't end for them. It doesn't end for them until it's finished finally. It's quite a thought, isn't it? All right. Isaiah 53, 1. If we'll look there real quick again. I got to get my Bible back there. Isaiah 53, 1. The question is, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? There's actually two questions there. They're not the same question. First question is, who hath believed our report? Who can believe this? And then the second question is, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who has had it revealed so they can believe it? You see the difference? And so um, the challenge, there's a challenge of believing the unbelievable here, but the questions imply an appeal. In this context, the parallel between the two questions implies the Lord's arm or power of salvation is revealed to those who believe the report. If you, by faith, believe in this incredible story, that it really was a gift of a sacrifice for our forgiveness of sin, if you're willing to believe it, then the arm of the Lord has revealed it to you. If the heart is willing, you can believe it. Right? So it says, um, do you want to experience God's saving power? Then you believe the report. Right? For us who have believed the report for a long time, it seems like such a simple thing. But what if somebody's not sure if they believe this? You know, say they've been hearing all kinds of anti-Christian things all their lives. How are they going to believe the report? It says, if your heart is willing, God reveals it to you, and then you know it's true. If your heart is willing, the Spirit impresses it upon you. All right, now look at Isaiah 53, 6. I was so tempted to comment more on that one. But Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the author asks this question. What is the text saying to you personally that should give you hope despite your past sins and failures? When I look at this verse, you know what it says to me personally? You know, because it says, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. It tells me that God knows everything that's wrong with me. He knows all the sins. He knows all the selfishness I've ever revealed, all the evil that has ever been in my heart. And, and even stuff that's not just been in my actions, just in my thoughts. He knows it all. And he took the wages of sin for me, for all of it. All of it. Because... What does he want? He wants to save me. And so he knows it all. Nothing's hid from him. And he paid the price. He paid it all. What, have, what reason will we have to hold back? I mean, you know, a husband and a wife might not want to tell each other every bad thing that comes to their mind. But God already knows and he loves us anyway. So it exceeds that of a husband and wife easily. Although I think my wife would pretty much accept me no matter how stupid I am. <laughs> she, she's, she, I might test her patience, though. <laughs> All right, so let's go to um, Wednesday's page. The Unreachable is Us. This is a very interesting page. And one of the challenges I have with this page is I cannot tell this page or put it in my own words better than the author did. And so I want to work through this and... Uh, you know, I'm going to do it in a way that hopefully it won't sound like I'm just reading to you, okay? It's a very interesting page, so let's follow the author's line of reasoning. We'll go, we'll start about four lines down. About four lines down, it says, even with the background provided earlier by Isaiah, which we looked at the background, we are not prepared in the sense that we are resigned to the Savior's fate. To the contrary, Isaiah has taught us to cherish the child born to us, you know, the wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace the supreme prince of, prince of peace. Others despise him, 
But we know he, who he really is, right? Or do we? As someone said, we have met the enemy and they are us. Ever heard that line before? Actually came out of a comic strip. Pogo. <laughs> yeah, we have met the enemy and they are us. What is the author getting at here? He says, you know, the servant, this servant was not the first to be spies, and he points out how King David went through a, a lot of rejection and despising and so on, and how when he had to flee from his son Absalom, who was trying to pull a coup and take over his kingdom, and Absalom, uh, they intended to kill David, because that's what you had to do if you are going to become king, right? So David had some idea what it means to be despised and rejected, you know, by his own son, so, but it says, but the suffering borne by this servant is not his own and does not result from his own sin, nor does he bear it merely for another individual. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. And the question is, why? And it says, the answer to the question, why, is Isaiah's testing truth. Because of God's love, his Messiah would choose to suffer. You say, but why? Isaiah drives the golden spike in to complete the unthinkable truth. He would choose to suffer in order to reach the unreachable, and the unreachable are us. Those who do not understand regard the servant as struck down by God, smitten by God. That was verse 4. And just as Job's friends thought his sin must have caused his suffering, and just as Jesus' disciples asked him who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, those who saw Jesus on the cross assumed the worst. Didn't Moses say that anyone hung on a tree is under the curse of God? Verse 4 said, We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. And yet, all this was God's will. Or, as it said in Isaiah, it pleased God to bruise him. Why? Because Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So it's Paul's words. Because God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul again. And then from Ellen White, what a price has been paid for us. Behold the cross and the victim uplifted upon it. Look at those hands pierced with the cruel nails. Look at his feet fastened with spikes to the tree. Christ bore our sins in his own body. That suffering, that agony, is the price of your redemption. Amen? And down at the bottom in the box, it says the weight, the guilt, the punishment for the sins of the whole world, every sin by every sinner, fell upon Christ at the cross at once as the only means to save us. And then the author asks this question, what does this tell us about how bad sin is? That such a price had to be paid in order to redeem us from it. And then the next question, what does it tell us about God's love that he would do this for us even at such a great cost? You, you almost just have to just ponder those obvious questions and answers. Let's go to Thursday's page. Isaiah 53.10, where it said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. He asked the question, what does it mean that the servant's life would be an offering for sin in verse 10? And he goes into the, the system of offerings explained in the book of Levit Leviticus, and he says the word here suggests that it, it is a guilt offering or reparation offering that could atone for deliberate wrongs against other people. And he, and he says that in this particular offering, the sinner needs to restore to the wrong person, like if they stole from him, they need to restore something to them plus a penalty. They give them more than they took. And they would do that before they offered the sacrifice. They would make reparation. And then following uh, down on the page, he said, following the reparation, there must be a sacrifice. And then he says, here it is in Isaiah 53. God's servant, instead of a ram, is led like a sheep to the slaughter on behalf of the people who have gone astray. This is the reparation offering. God provided it himself. He paid the penalty. He did everything. And then the servant comes forth from death, the land of no return, to receive exaltation, to see his offspring, to see his children, or his seed, as King James says, 
and to prolong his days. So at the end of this lesson, there's a several verses to look up, and obviously we don't have time to look up all of them. But how do, how, the question is, what message, how does it connect to Isaiah 53? Well, the second one, Romans 5, 8, says, but God, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It kind of fits Isaiah 53 well. But I want to go down to the last one and look it up. 1 Peter 2. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. When you see this passage, you have no doubt Peter's thinking about Isaiah 53. All right, 1 Peter 2. And this is where we're going to close. 1 Peter 2. So 1 Peter 2, 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. And verse 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, or neither was deceit found in his mouth, like Isaiah 53, verse 9 said. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Direct quote from verse 5 of Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. Verse 25, you'll recognize this from verse 6, for ye were as sheep going astray but now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Is it, so, is it obvious that Peter's thinking about Isaiah 53 here? And this is a precious, precious passage to him. Uh, I would like to close by looking at the summary. The summary says, Having told about the birth, identity, and career of God's deliverer, Isaiah finally reveals the supreme tragedy that gives us hope to reach, save, and heal lost people, including us. God's servant voluntarily bears our suffering and punishment. So you can see how Isaiah, why Isaiah is called the gospel prophet. I mean, that was about as strong gospel as you can get, primarily out of the Old Testament. So again, if you want a CD or DVD of this lesson, uh, call us at 916-457-6511, email us at csh at sacscentral.org, ask for offer C22110, and... Um, Again, thank you for joining us today. And again, those are live stream audience. We invite you to write us a letter or note. Tell us what you appreciate about Central Study Hour. We'll share it in Central Study Hour. So again, thank you for joining us. And may God bless you and guide you.